Welcome to part two of Two Atheists and a Christian Walk into a Bar with special guest Sam Piazza on this week's episode of Semi-Retired. To use your example, uh, I know it's a provocative example that maybe on any planet anywhere in the universe, here, Andromeda Galaxy, whatever, where a species evolved to the point where cooperation and communal effort became something that it could perceive was to its advantage. Okay, so not like a pack of wild dogs where if the food supply gets short, they'll eat the babies. A society, uh, a group of people or another species like us in some way that was becoming more intelligent, becoming more able to perceive that the fruits of its collective labor was a benefit. I think it would quickly realize, I think, and maybe I'm making your point for you in a different way, that torturing its own babies wasn't in the collective interest. It upset the mothers, it upset the fathers, it caused the tribe not to grow as quickly as it might otherwise do. And yet, I can imagine at a certain level, somewhere along that continuum, if that tribe ran out of food, it would eat its own young because it would have to to survive. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a little further along, there'd there'd be a cutoff point. People uh, resort to cannibalism. Uh, Modern people have done famously, even in the last couple of centuries, you get people stuck in a snowy mountain pass and they Mm -hmm. resort to cannibalism. It's that or die even though eating fellow human beings, generally speaking, considered in very bad taste. Yes. Pun intended. Pun intended, (laughs) exactly. So I don't know if that gets at what you're getting at or not. I would slightly disagree there because I don't think that what is good is necessarily what is useful. Because I think that's what you guys, or sorry, Dave, you're getting at, is that if something is useful for us in the community, that therefore... (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry about that. We should should, uh, promote those things and... What I'm saying is I think the group collectively realizes it's good. This mythical tribe I'm talking about that has settled down, hunter-gatherers, you know, and they've begun to develop agriculture. So they're growing crops now. And so the hunters need to go less further afield. Life becomes a bit more settled and there's a sense of family. I think that those people, as, as they develop, would, again, I think certain behaviors would be obviously not helpful to the situation. I think common sense would dictate that, yes. But I think there's also, we can come up with tons of examples where the tribe would be justified in doing something that is useful for the overall health of the tribe, but individually would be detrimental to specific individuals. Very possible, yeah. Killing a stranger wanders into your village, feeling the threat of a stranger killing him as opposed to seeing what he wants. Yeah. I can believe or that. it can also be like I can believe that, yeah. you have a newborn that is disabled, let's say, and yep. they're taking more resources from the tribe yep. than they're mm-hmm. they're giving. So it's like, what is what would be the utility of keeping that person in the tribe if we're only going? I see off your point. Yeah. yeah, I can see that being a, uh, from a pure utility perspective, mm-hmm. not going to be able to keep up, not going to be able to contribute. Exactly. Maybe we just leave that one over in the bushes, and if the hyenas take it off, well, okay, exactly. You know, uh, yeah. that's tough jungle logic yeah and from there you're you're two steps from from abortion <laughs> that's pretty much what i what i was trying to get to is just that i think that morality w- what we all instinctively know to be moral and true are things that are independent of human opinion and in that sense they are uh, objectively true and so because they are objective it, it is it would be a weird let's say um feature of the universe if there are if there were in fact such things right because as I was, as I was saying before if there are these rules that are that exist regardless of whether humans exist then it's almost as if they are part of like the universal fab- fabric so we have to ask ourselves why is that the case right why why is the universe in a sense moral it's it's a very puzzling question i think from an atheistic standpoint and i would say as a christian there is an explanation for that is because god is the source of goodness and morality, and he is the one that, by his nature, in a sense, generates or gives forth these laws that are instinctual to us. Okay, no, uh, But only for us, yet he lets animals eat their young. Why does the rule not carry across there? Why do we think it's wrong to eat our young, but it's okay to watch a bear eat its young? Well, we're always freaked out when we see it happen. But why in nature, we say, oh, well, that's nature. Well, aren't we nature too? And why do those rules apply there, but not to us? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, and I think that's where there's a, there's a construct that something's been told to us that that is wrong. Uh, we know it's wrong, but why do we allow it there? I guess I think I'm, I'm arguing against myself here. <laughs> I do it all the time. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the Bible actually talks about in Genesis when it tells us that we are created in God's image. The authors of the uh, Genesis make a distinction between man, as in humans, and then the creature, so the created beings. There's a bit of study that has to go into this, into into understanding what is the difference between man and the non-human animals. The main difference between the two is that humans, by virtue of being created in the image, the image of God, have certain qualities that make them fundamentally different from animals. So, for example, you you might say that humans have free will. Animals do not. Animals are... I know this, again, some people might disagree here, but we are self-aware. We know that we exist. We have a self that is distinct from others. We can communicate. We can think about actions in the past, uh, present, and future. Animals cannot do that. So there's yeah, a... Well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, okay. Keep going. But, and I, yeah, on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I'm essentially saying is the difference there is explained in the Bible and is fundamental to each. So I don't know what else to add there. You know, animals can learn. We know that. We know they have memories. One of my guilty pleasures is watching these videos on YouTube where people get reunited with animals they haven't seen for years, including lions or mm -hmm. something or a baboon. And the thing comes running up and throws its arms around them because it remembers that human. Mm -hmm. So it remembers past events. It associates probably a feeling of safety with that human. In some cases, you know, the story will be told that this particular person, man or woman, saved this young animal from a uh, whatever. It, it was abandoned by its mother, took it in, brought, and then released it in the wild. It remembers. I've seen crows, very smart, learn complex tricks and then teach them to other crows so that they all know. So they're not as advanced as we are. They're not writing novels or making podcasts. But does the crow know what it's doing? Can't ask it, but it seems to. Usually it's quite simple. It's trying to get it some food. In the videos I've watched, in this particular case, a German woman who is very much into her crows, she comes up with puzzles for them to solve. And they show up and they're ready to solve the puzzle and they're digging in and they learn the puzzle and they got to mm -hmm. figure this out and pulse and then they get to their little piece of food. So they're trying to get at the food. So that's kind of a good basic instinct, but they learn to solve problems to get at the food. I think the fact that they can learn and repeat behaviors to get what they want shows that they are aware. They're, yeah. They are aware. My cat has me trained. My chair doesn't train me. My cat can train. Has trained me that when he meows, I will go for it, bed it, because <laughs> that's our relationship. It's aware of that. What it does will give them a result. It's not just a dumb animal that's going only on instinct, and otherwise it wouldn't. It wouldn't have remembered that if I meow, they're going to come every so, time. It would have to relearn to meow. How does it know to meow to get me to come and pet it? Uh, See that thing, my best friend, the octopus. No, I have not. My octopus teacher. Sorry, guy makes friends with an octopus. And of course, because octopi are so strange looking, it's not like a nice fuzzy cat yeah. where, you know, comes in and licks you and all that. It's like this weird thing, but it makes friends with him and it looks forward to seeing him and it reacts to him and it shows him apparently affection, not the other divers, but this guy. So you go, okay, that's interesting. This octopus has more going for it than I thought. <laughs> it's not just a weird bag of meat with sticky arms. Many of them. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the fact that we learned to write also gave us an advantage in that we can start creating myths. We start creating these things and we, we give names and we give deities certain powers because for things we don't understand. Do the cats look at us the same way and say, wow, that guy, that guy gives me food. Is, is he God? I can't discount the fact that they are thinking beings and they can't. I'm not, I'm not saying they're going to write the next great no. bear novel. But to discount it, I think it's, it's very arrogant of the human species to think that the beaver or the cat or even, yes, our friend the platypus is, <laughs> is nothing more than an experiment gone wrong yeah. and that does not have more than instinct and reaction. You, you see it when, when they nurture their young. You see it when they interact, when they play. Why would they play? Why would they play if they were not aware? You ever seen otters play or foxes yeah. chase each other? Yeah. I mean, that is awareness of not just, oh, I have an instinct that if I I do this, that is me tapping on the table as if I'm, I'm a fox, uh, <laughs> that the other one will chase me. Mm -hmm. They are aware. And I, th I, I, the fact that we were able to take that awareness and then be able to write and communicate in a way we allowed us to create our creators.
That's one of our big innovations. We created our creators. They did not create us. So you're saying that our belief in God is something that we came up with for a certain reason? Yeah, absolutely. So what is the main reason then? To explain what they couldn't understand. Why does the sun come up? First thing, I'm sure we worshipped was the sun. The sun comes up every day. Oh, it must be good. It must be a being. It must be a deity. We will follow God. At some point, some guy goes, oh, by the way, it's not the sun. It's the wind. We see the sun, but we don't see the wind. You ever notice? We don't see the wind, but we feel it. That must be God. Why did my crops fail? Why did my baby die? Why did the tribe from across the hill come and, you know, steal our horses? And I think it helps people. I'm sure all those people in Turkey, that horrible earthquake that's killed now 46,000 people in southern Turkey, northern Syria, I'm sure it's helping a lot of people. I respect this. To believe that there was some kind of higher force involved, that there's a reason for it. It wasn't just a random tectonic plate shift that destroyed their city and killed everybody they know, because that's hard to take. That's like the randomness, I think, is hard to take. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good point. It's a good way why, to put why it. Why yeah. do bad things happen to good people? Well, it's random. Any, anybody can walk out and get hit by a car. Talking about Christianity tonight, Richard and I are obviously being critical here, but I think one of the things I can say that I think is good, one of the better manifestations in some people is that it gives people a sense of comfort when bad times come. People in my family, here, I see that, my brother's side of the family, and, and I know that helps them, and I can't take that away. A, a loved one suddenly contracts a horrible disease and dies, and it, it helps not to just I, I, I would have to deal with that and like, that's just bad luck. And I would have to live with that. I'm okay with that. If they want to involve a belief and that makes it easier for them, I'm not taking that away. I think there's a certain tit for tat for that. It's like, if the deity is responsible for, well, yeah. for what happened, for my crops failing because I didn't sacrifice enough goats this year, or I spoke ill to Job in the village next year. Well, maybe if I'm good next year, the same guy will bring me good luck. I find it's like a bargaining chip. We're there to blame it when bad things happen, yeah. but when good things happen, we'll say, well, conversely, that must be it. Mm-hmm. It must be there. So if I if I try to do enough, maybe I can game the system. Yeah, and I'll get some good luck in the end. You know, like like uh, as you get as, <laughs> as often as you see people as they get older, they become more and more uh, religious, as if they're cramming for the exam. Hmm. That's definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it can go both ways. Like you guys are saying, like obviously it gives comfort to people who are yeah. struggling in tough times. But that I is said, also I accept that and I respect it. Mm-hmm. For me, there's another, there's another part of it that is, it goes beyond that. I think faith is not just something that's useful, it's essential. And it's essential in, in one, one aspect and multiple aspects, but one particular aspect is the existential side of things. So for example, I think what you mentioned is one of them, right? It gives us comfort when we're suffering, but it also gives meaning to everything we do. Like in virtue of the world being created purposefully by a being for a purpose that imbues everything with a meaning through that. So I think that without a God, we have to accept the conclusion that like we're here by chance. That's right? correct. There's no reason why we're here other than that. I've signed on to that, by yeah. the way. I kind of like that. I like, I like that, that it's not someone's plan that decided, yeah. oh, by the way, let me make some puppets who will then worship me because I need the worship. If you're all powerful, why do you need us to worship you? You should be happy that you created the universe. You're such an egomaniac, right? Is what you're saying? <laughs> I sometimes see it like that. It's like we've, we they've set up entire societies that now funnel the love as if it runs on love or worship. It's like it can't exist unless we worship it. Oh, hold on. It can't exist unless we worship it. That's the answer right there. God does not need our worship. Well, it certainly puts it down in the book that he needs our worship. Go on. I'll stop interrupting. God likes to receive our worship, but he certainly does not need our worship. God is entirely self-sufficient in his being, does not need anything from us. But if God created us, then worship is like the proper act, so to speak, to do. Thank you. It could be a form of thanking God, yeah. Um, it could be, let's see. I hate to be I cynical, mean, but, but where's the you're welcome? Well, if, see, if God... It's, it's not an earthquake and it's not a holocaust. I think you have to view it from a different, different perspective because if God exists, then literally everything everywhere, including your own life, is given by God, right? So... The fact that, for example, I'm alive right now and I can breathe and I don't have like, I don't have heart problems or whatever. I have a job. I'm living in a relatively peaceful place. I'm not under attack every day. I'm not afraid to go outside. God does not owe me any of these things, right? Like God doesn't owe me a life of 75 years. If he takes my life tomorrow, 
that's God's prerogative. He can do whatever you want. And I would not have anything to say to God because there's nothing that I contributed to me being here right now. Yes, I am a good worker, let's say. My boss might tell me that. I am responsible with how I spend my money. But how much of my personal success today is due to factors outside of my control versus in my control, I think the, the proportion is astronomically in the favor of outside of my control. I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You're alive, you're in good health, things are going well for you. How do you compare that to the guy in Turkey who just watched his entire family get flattened by a building? Mm -hmm. Does he turn and say, I know you have a plan, thank you for taking my family? How is that part of the plan and how does that make sense to someone who believes? For me, it's an earthquake. The plates shook. That's what happened. It's unfortunate that people died. I feel terrible for them. But to say that that's, that's part of God's plan, that 46,000 people, 36,000, whatever numbers, the number yeah. is today, died, it's part of the plan. If God was an employee, I think he'd be fired. Honestly? Is that true? Would, would a Christian say that's part of God's plan today? Would a modern day Christian say that? So uh, the, answer, <laughs> the short answer is yes and no, because... When we use the, the term God's plan, it, it, I think it assumes that like it was God's intention that this bad thing happened. Mm -hmm. I think God can have different desires. So for example, if you're trying to explain why there is so much evil and suffering in the world, you could say that when creating this world, God wanted to make the world in such a way that there was the most amount of goodness, presumably is one of God's intentions, right? He wants to create a world where people can make let's say, decisions that are free decisions. And I would say that that's a necessity to make, to be moral. But so things where love, like true love, sacrifice, success, all these things can be experienced. That is also a world where bad things can happen. That's just the nature of these things. Because I can love someone, I can, it, it has to be a free choice. I also have the option to be mean to that person. I can do something that's against their well-being. But by allowing that possibility, it's like the fact that the good is possible sort of outweighs the potential of the bad. So it's like, yes, suffering can occur as, as a result of many different things. And most of the suffering, I would say, in this world is due to bad moral decisions by humans. Um, it's, a fair, it's, it's a fair statement, yeah. But yeah, so I think overall, the world is set up in such a way, and I, this is a, a complicated question to get to your point, because there's also the, the question of uh, what about the events that are outside of our, our control, independent of, of human moral choices, like uh, earthquakes. earthquakes. Yeah. For that, I mean, it's a tough question. I'd have to get back on you on, on that, because uh, it's, it's something I think about too. I think that, generally speaking, it's, I mean, some Christians have said that it's, it's just part of having a ordered universe, right? So, for example, the fact that the universe has certain predictable, stable laws, like the fact that, you know, if I drop a rock, whatever, it's always going to fall at the same gravity, uh, gravity rate, right? These the uniform laws across time, that sort of thing allows for the possibility of natural disasters, right? Mm -hmm. That the, the interaction between different laws and, and stuff make it so that, unfortunately, those things can happen. But overall, like I said, on, on the grand scheme of things, it is better to have a universe with a reliable sort of experience with that. I mean, that that's just one potential response. But I, I would say that, generally speaking, it is a, a tough, tough thing to, to answer. So so it's almost like you're using the, the, the opportunity of chance to account for the natural disaster. So God creates a universe, puts in sets of physical laws. Mm -hmm. This is the earth. It is made of molten whatever yeah. lava they've the earth is made of what molten rock yes <laughs> yes molten rock lava otherwise molten known as lava nature. yeah <laughs> and because of its nature will sometimes decide to uh plates will rub against and people may die so i have created this in my goodness or out of whatever and the chance of the physical thing i have built can possibly kill all these people once i've created i step back and i let things Whatever happens, happens. I don't think I'd entirely agree with that, but I, I see what you're going. Yeah. Essentially, that's, yeah. that, that's what it comes down to. We're saying, well, you know, why does he let earthquakes happen? Well, he doesn't let earthquakes happen. He created a world in which earthquakes 
can happen, mm-hmm. and so so they happen. It's not that he's willingly and neglected down. to put up the "do not live here" signs. Yet, according to the the books, he created the Great Flood because he was pissed off and drowned half the world. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, we have to let it rain for forty days. So, kill so, off half the so world. So we're sort of we're we're starting to rub up against another concept which we haven't gotten to yet, mm-hmm. which is the concept of what happens to people when they die. So 46,000 people, humans, lost their lives through no faults of their own in Turkey uh, in the last week or two because of the earthquake. You know, mostly Muslim, I imagine, because of that part of the world they're from. There can be some atheists in there for sure. Just law of averages, I guess. Where are they? Short answer, I don't know. Okay. Um, can- where, where does Christianity say they are? Christianity states that when we die until, um, you know, Jesus comes back and that's going to be, we don't know when. People who are dead are sort of in a a temporary resting place and they will be judged on the judgment day. And when that happens, then they will either go to heaven or hell. However, the, the process of judgment is something that I think a lot of people don't fully understand. Because I think the assumption here is that how can a good and just God send people to hell if, and you can comment here, but... I might have said that, yeah. yeah. Oh, he created the original waiting room, yeah. the purgatory. Yeah. Well, so that's, uh, <laughs> some Christians disagree on whether purgatory exists, but... Okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the overall notion is that God will send these people to hell, and it may or may not be justified because it's literally up to God. So uh, I think that one thing we know for sure is that if God is perfectly just and perfectly loving, that uh, he will judge us in according to the perfect justice. And so he judges based on what we believe and also what we've done during our lives. This is the final judgment before you're going up or you're going down. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Okay. Yeah. When I say that, it sounds flippant. I shouldn't do that. Okay. You're being judged, Dave, whatever. So when you die, you don't go straight up or down? You often hear, oh, you know, mommy's in heaven, she died, she's in heaven now. But there's, you're saying there's a belief that that only happens at the end, at the final judgment and between now when the person dies and the final judgment they are in, whether it's called purgatory or whatever. whatever. I don't personally believe in, in a purgatory, but the, the Bible talks about how, you know, our souls aren't in like a, a temporary resting place until the, the last day. And then we're, I guess, moved. So that means, and again, I'm not trying to be too literal. That means um, for the last, since Jesus died, on the assumption that all that's true and he was mm-hmm. crucified and so on and so forth, 2,000 years ago, everybody who's died in the last 2,000 years is still waiting for a final judgment. Waiting. Uh, well, they, they, they haven't, but they've yet to be judged. They may not have a sense that they're waiting. Right. I have no idea, but okay. yeah, they're, well, they are. I didn't know that. Here. I've never heard that. Okay. That would be a, a devout Christian belief that all those millions of people who like, you know, and again, people in say Northern Japan who've never heard of Christianity yeah. would be in the same boat. Yeah. Yes. But that excludes everyone who came before. So. Oh yeah, that's true. In Christianity, there's, you know, obviously the, the question comes up of like what happens for the people who did not hear the gospel. Or, okay. Who That's came after it, yeah. Jesus Christ. Or, or so. before to Richard's point, right? Before. Before yeah. the gospel. Yeah. The gospel. Okay, before the gospel. Yeah. Okay. That's what I mean. Yeah. So those people would still be, they're not excluded from, from heaven or, or any benefits, let's say. Okay. They, and like I was saying before, we have the you know general revelation and special revelation. So the general revelation applies to them. The special does not because they did not have the opportunity to hear the gospel. But they still are accountable for what they know. So the Bible talks about how God judges, judges us based on the light we've received. And I think that is one of the, the points there. It's like, okay, well, these people back then only had access to certain information about God, not the full, let's say, revelation. And therefore, they will be judged on that information. We today, and I know that there's people's tribes that have never heard the gospel, but I'm just saying. Or me, for that matter. I haven't heard it either. Okay, so uh, I'm I'd love dead to, serious. I'd, no, you I'd know love, of it. But well, you I've heard, heard it, it exactly. but I mean, yeah, I've never yeah, heard yeah. it. I mean, I'm aware. Of, I'm aware of it as a concept. But look, in the context of this conversation, let's be serious. I'm in no better shape than some guy living in the Amazon. Well, I'd love to, to share the gospel with you. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> in part seven of the podcast. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, generally speaking, uh, we would be just judged based on what we know. So there's a, an equality there. Let's say. 
just that part makes me think it was man-made. There's just too many exceptions to this rule. So everybody who came before the Old Testament, like Ugg, poor Ugg the caveman, is judged on a separate set of rules. From Old Testament to New Testament, we have general. Ugg may be part of general, I don't know, but where it's yeah. decided where the line is. And then everybody after gets special revelation. And there's like special treatment there, which sounds like an elitist system that man would have made. I don't think it, I would consider that a special treatment. I think it's just different information. And it's not necessarily better or worse. One might argue that it's worse if you don't have special revelation because you're not receiving the full understanding of who God is. If God is truly just, I, I think he, he could have communicated to people in such a way that they had, still were able to receive, let's say, a, a full enough understanding of him. That's what I would say generally. Okay. So Ugg the caveman yeah. is polyamorous. After the gospel, frowned upon, pretty much. Does Ugg get special compensation because in his belief, that was okay? It's a silly example. I'm just throwing it. And that's where I find it kind of falls apart. If it was all-knowing, all-being, all-goodness, there would be no differentiation because he would know. Ugg was good, Ugg was bad. The guy in the Old Testament was good, was bad. The one after is good, is bad doesn't need to have followed the rules because he can see into our soul, if such a thing exists, whether we are good or bad. And so I think the special dispensations for whenever you were born sounds like something a bureaucrat would make. And once again, I think it would be fired. I can concede that. Yeah, I think. However, like if we go back to the point that God is perfectly just, I don't see any problem there. And yes, if, if someone in the past, like the, the caveman had four wives, and actually there's biblical patriarchs who had multiple wives. Um, Methuselah like was like almost a thousand years old, I'm sure, you know. Didn't L. Ron Hubbard have multiple wives? I think. <laughs> the Scientology guy? <laughs> I have no idea. I think so. Yeah. If I was to take on a belief system, I would prefer, and maybe it's, maybe it's simplistic of me, to believe that an all-knowing God, an all-good God, would not care what you read or not, and would go by the goodness in your heart. As simple as that. As much as I hate saying that expression, the goodness in your I heart. I thought you were going to say you were going for polygamy. <laughs> You, you, you dis disappointed me there. Listen. Okay. If, if, just saying. It's good polygamy. Just saying. If you, no, but I like what you said. You know, you know uh, to just me, that's just. Read the goodness in a person's heart if, if yeah. such a system was in place. Yeah. You got the wrong instructions. You didn't fill out form and triplicate. As Christians, we're not aware of like the intricacies of how the judging will happen. We don't know if like, okay, well, you had information X, so you're going to have like 20% right. less judgment than this guy, or you're going to have 40%. Forgive us if we get too literal, but I think that's what happens for atheists is we're looking for a literal description, almost like a, a parts list of how it's going to work, because the idea is is so odd to us that we can't help but want to know how exactly is that going to work. I can't. I know. That, I'm yeah. sure you can. And so I said, yeah. forgive us yeah. if we're if we're pushing too far in that direction. I mean, I want to know it too because I'm like Richard. I'm thinking, well, that seems awfully complicated mm -hmm. as a system. There's one you know? thing I, I'd like to add just yeah. before. Go yeah, go we, ahead. We move on to another topic, but yeah. One thing that a lot I think a lot of people uh, misunderstand about the nature of heaven and hell is that. A lot of people think that hell is sort of like this eternal punishment place that is like, okay, well, if you're bad, you know, you're, you're going there and that's your punishment. Well, it's certainly what the advertising says. <laughs> yeah, in, in a sense. I mean, there's different views of, of what hell constitute in Christianity. Some think it's like a eternal conscious torment. Some think it's a, annihilation. So you just go and you, you just cease to exist. There's other views, but... Well, Dante's uh, Nine Circles of Hell. Is that, is yeah. Nine Dante's Circles? Inferno. Or Dante's the, yeah. Inferno. That's, yeah. that's what's been portrayed. And you know what? The church hasn't really denied any of that because it was convenient. Because if you think that you're going down to a fire pit with little devils poking you in the ass all the time, it kind of nudges you into being good, which, you know, it's, it's some sort of reinforcement. Is it positive reinforcement? No. But they never denied that that's not what's happening because uh, they don't know. Yeah. The church, I'm saying. Yes. Okay. There is not a set position that all Christians agree on on that, on what hell constitutes. I have to ask, because I don't know this, do the concepts of heaven and hell first appear in the Old Testament or the New Testament? They're in both. And the Old Testament is written long before Jesus, or is is of times long before Jesus' time, right? I, I, should, I just want to confirm that. That's what I think. 6,000 yeah. years? Is that the, like that? the thing in no, theory? No, no. 4,000? 
No, I'm pretty sure it's like between a thousand and seven hundred years. And then there's, and then there's a gap, and then there's a gap, and then there's yeah. the, okay. It might be like a, a gap of like a thousand five hundred to seven hundred. Okay, I, I'd have to double check that. Okay. But for our purposes, that's it. I just wanted to again. I should know that just from general education perspective. But sometimes I'm not sure. I've Richard can call me out on. Uh, well, there's on always that. Uh, the old interweb. Yeah. So it says about twelve hundred to one sixty five oh, BC sorry, that, sorry. is the Old Testament period. Yeah. Oh, really? So right oh, down to okay. 165. I that. Okay. And then the well, New Testament is... what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Jesus' so, time. BC, eh? We're talking BC. BC, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Just to cap up what I was saying. Yeah, no, like, do it, yeah. Um, the, the Bible describes hell as like a place of outer darkness. I think what a lot of people don't get is like, hell is just the lack of goodness. A lot of people think it's like, oh, you know, there's, there's this fire and it's like torturous and all, this, all these things where it's like, well, maybe, but I think what the main point is that... Heaven is being in the presence of God. Hell is not having the presence of God. Being if, without. If God is the source of all goodness, light, all these things, then you won't have those things there. That's just to say that... I, it's I not eternal punishment. It's eternal eternity without the goodness. So it's, it's an yeah, eternity it's, of it's, absence, kind of like space. In a sense, yeah, I would say that. And, and the, the yeah. last thing also I would say is that people will be sent to the place where they according to how they lived and what they believed demanded and I, maybe that's not the right word but i think a lot of their ideal of goodness is that what you're saying no i think it's more like let's say you're living in this in your life you were always like rejecting god because I, I believe that god gives us opportunities to commune with him to relate to him and so we all have opportunities multiple opportunities in our life to connect with him and when we reject him we're essentially saying like we don't want god and so god being a loving father he wants to respect our decisions and so he will not force us to go into heaven against our will so a lot of people think like why am i not going to heaven like i did all these things whatever but like god wants to respect your decision if you in your during your entire life were constantly rejecting god and want nothing to do with them why would god send you to a place which would actually literally be hell for you if you rejected God, that's why would you yeah. want to yeah. spend eternity in his presence? Exactly. So yeah. it's like, yeah. that's how I view it is like, okay, well, God loves you so much that he respects your decision not to be with him, but to be in what you wanted, which was the absence of God. That would be me in the presence of Bob Dylan for eternity. <laughs> <laughs> Crap. Just thinking uh, of it now. I'm weeping just thinking of it. <laughs> I get it now. And it's the soul. It's the soul that goes to heaven or hell. The physical body crumbles or, you know, decays or, you know, dust to dust or whatever. And yeah, it's the soul exactly. which is created at birth, I guess. No, the soul exists eternally. The soul is not created at... Oh, no, no. Bapt okay. Because well, if, uh, if you're not baptized, technically you, you, you go to hell, right? Or purgatory or, uh, sorry, limbo, as they call it. I think right? that's a, a Catholic... Uh, yeah, view. well, yeah. Uh, sorry. I don't believe that. Because <laughs> that's the thing, right? That the bunch, between, yeah. There's purgatory and there's limbo. So unbaptized babies go to limbo. I, I don't really know much about that, to be honest. We're kidding around maybe even too much. And so the concept is, is the soul, like my soul, mm -hmm. on the assumption I have one, if I believe that, yeah. pre-existed me. Yeah. And when I was born, it entered me as a baby. I guess you can say it like that. It's not really specified, but yeah. It's pre-existing before you're born, it exists? Yes, and because you, the soul is eternal. The soul is like a, it's a non-physical immaterial part of us, which will last forever. It doesn't make sense that the soul was created at a certain point in time. It, it, it existed. It's my but. Catholic upbringing is a... Yeah, I don't have that. <laughs> so, universe has been around for 13.8 billion years. So science says. Coincidental or concomitant with the creation of the galaxies and all that, all the matter and all that, therefore was a certain number of souls. Mm -hmm. And they've been waiting all these millennia for humans on this planet, this little tiny time frame to start getting born so that they could attach themselves to these various bodies. Uh, I guess that's that about way right. I don't know. I'm literally trying to understand what the concept is, like how I would describe it to somebody else. Yeah, I guess so. I I don't think that God is like, you know, looking at, he has a sort of like conveyor belt of no, souls. No, I don't think he's his, actually, no. His... Maybe I'll have too literal a mind. But I, I have to wonder how I would describe it to somebody else yeah. who was asking me that question. And I, that's what I'm thinking. Like, I got mine, mm -hmm. I die, it's going to go on. Mm -hmm. Does it get somebody else or was I it? Does your soul bring anyone else? Yeah, does my soul attach itself to somebody else? No. So it was one off on me. Each of us has one soul. Yes, correct. And it pre-existed us. Yes. We're born, we somehow get associated with it, 
And when our physical body dies, it just keeps on going. Yeah, and the Bible says that after the end times, after judgment, God will create a new heaven and new earth, and we will be given new glorified bodies. The definition of glorified is some people have different uh, views on that. But the way I understand is that we, I think I'm entirely okay with the idea that we will have bodies like the ones we have today, yeah. but would just be like immune to disease. Uh, More ripped. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, we'll, maybe we'll be like, you know. If that's what you want. Maybe we'll be like in our prime, you know, but just yeah. like, <laughs> you know, 32 okay. years old. You okay. know? But, but yeah, that's, those are just side, side questions. See, those are big for me. Okay. Because as an atheist, I like to understand what my fellow humans, my friends, acquaintances are, belie- are thinking or believing. And I need to have it described to some level of detail. So it makes some kind of sense to me. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I, again, I don't believe it, but at least I can start to grasp it as a concept. Like I like where like I have to ask myself, where are those souls? Mm-hmm. Like I don't mean that to sound facetious or anything. Yeah. It's like where are they? What are they? What happens to them? I'm not sure if I'm picking this up from a movie or, or or whatever, or if it's part of Revelations or whatever. But wasn't there like a finite number of souls, and once they've run out, that's when judgment comes? Are you referring to the the one hundred forty four thousand prophecy? I'm not sure. I picked this up somewhere. It might be that. I don't know. But there was a th- a, an idea that there's a, a finite number. And once we've expended those, right? Once attached to the hanging out in Point Clair Village too late at night, Richard. That's what it is. 